well, look, everybody, look how divided we are. Wouldn't it be better for one, as tragic as that might be, for one to die rather than we all be destroyed? That's the old logic. What does the gospel do is it fractures that logic. Because God is not approving of scapegoating violence. God is identifying with the victim of scapegoating violence. And thereby, this is Gerard, pulls back the veil on this whole demonic process. Welcome back to the Word on Fire show. I'm Brandon Vaught, the host and the senior publishing director at Word on Fire. Why are so many of us tempted to scapegoat people, especially online? And how do we escape this trap? That's what we'll be discussing today with Bishop Robert Barron, who joins us from our new studio in Rochester, Minnesota. Bishop, good to be with you, as always. Hey, Brandon, good to see you. And wondering, uh, is the hurricane heading your way down there in Florida? Oh, it's been a terrible hurricane season just, for us in Florida. Record-breaking number of, of them, but yeah, uh, for now, just, we're, we're okay. All right, good. Good. We've been together a lot of times over the last, I don't know, two, three months. I was just with you yeah. a couple days ago there in Rochester, but last right. month, the two of us attended the annual G.K. Chesterton Conference. This is sponsored by the Society of G.K. Chesterton, and it travels around the country, but this year it was in Minneapolis, mm-hmm. which is just over an hour away from where you are, and so they yeah. invited you to come give the keynote talk. Tell us about what you spoke on and what the conference was like. I love the conference. It was a lot of fun. Uh, great people there. You know, Chestertonians have something in common. They're they're like their their master. You know, they're kind of ebullient and joyful. And um, especially Dale Alquist, you know, who's the head of that operation. And uh, Dale's talk was so rich and smart and funny and you know just delightful. I spoke on, um, it's the 100th anniversary of the publication of G.K.'s book on St. Francis. So that was the focus of the conference. So I, I read that book as a kid, you know, many years ago. But then once I knew they, they invited me, I, I got the book again and read it. And it was like reading it for the first time. It had been so long. And I was just, you know, massively impressed by it. So I did a, I think I called my talk, Looking at St. Francis with Fresh Eyes, you know, looking at this text again. Um, so I loved it. It was a great fun conference. We recorded your talk, so if it's not already on YouTube, oh, I know right? we'll be we'll be putting it up there soon. Oh, so good. I'll include okay. a link to that. I didn't know that. Good. Well, today I want to talk with you about scapegoating. It's it's something you've studied and reflected on a lot over the years, particularly through the lens of the great philosopher Rene Girard. Um, Rene yeah. Girard was one of the most influential Catholic philosophers of the past century. In fact, when he mm-hmm. died in 2015, he was 91 years old. You described him as a modern church father. Uh, tell us yeah. about Rene Girard and the basics of his life before we get to some of his key ideas. Yeah, an extraordinary figure, born 1923. Uh, you know, my mother, who just passed away, was born in 1922, so he was right in her generation. He was born in that uh, wonderful papal town of Avignon in the south of France, educated over in, in France and in Paris, uh, but his academic career really unfolded in our country. So he came as a young man to these shores, and he taught various places, University of Indiana, uh, New York State University in Buffalo, also at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. Um, but then he ended up his academic career uh, at Stanford on the West Coast and spent you know, about 40 years there. So he was an academic, a Frenchman of his generation, uh, so Catholic you know, by, uh, by heritage and by baptism, but had become basically an agnostic. And he was a student of French language and, and literature, and a, a literary theorist, we probably would say. In the course of his reading of many of the great novelists and, and playwrights, he discovered the dynamics that he spent his career really developing. Uh, and then, at a key moment, he read the, the Bible. And you know, he knew it in a vague way, but as he, he looked into it, he found that it was as aware, as, uh, as all these great novelists were, of the basic problem. But the difference was the Bible proposed a real solution. And that led Girard by some steady steps to become a Catholic. And so he, he dies a very ardent Catholic. And um, his work came to the attention of religious people. Uh, I would have come across it as a seminarian. I, one of my professors knew about him. And um, Father Steve, you know, the CEO of War on Fire, has always been a big devotee of Girard. And I think he got me into it more and more. Had a chance to meet him. He came to Mundelein Seminary when I was a professor there to give our Meyer lecture. So I spent, you know, a few days with him. And 
he was a massively impressive person, not just as a thinker, but as a human being. I, I loved his his simplicity, his modesty, his humility. Um, very impressive man. As you say, died in 2015. I was thinking the very year that I came out to California as a bishop uh, was the year that Gerard died. So that's a little sketch of his life. You could maybe sum up Gerard's thinking through his two master ideas of mimetic desire and scapegoating. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about each one of those two. What's interesting is how they fit together and inform each other. Uh, let's yeah. let's start off by talking about mimetic desire, sometimes described as mimesis. What does this mean? Yeah. Well, Gerard said that desire is hardly ever uh, straightforward, where there's something good and I desire it. Rather, desire typically has a triangular and mimetic quality. Now, here's what he means. Why do I want object, you know, X? Well, not just because of qualities inherent in object X, but because somebody else wants object X. And so I look at the desire of somebody else and I imitate that desire. So there's a triangularity about it. It's not just me to the object, it's me to the object, but through the person I'm imitating. Now, I know that can sound very abstract, but any, uh, you know this, Brandon, from your extensive experience with your own kids, um, two toddlers in a room, pile of toys. Toddler A is completely indifferent to a particular toy until what? Till toddler B wants it. And the minute toddler B wants that uh, toy, toddler A is intensely interested in it. And the desire is imitative and triangular. And, and again, as any father would know, what's the result of that triangularity? Conflict, right? Hey, he, he has that, that toy. Yeah, but you know, five minutes ago, you had zero interest in it. Yes, I know, but now I'm intensely interested in it, and I don't want him to have it. So conflict tends to come from the triangularity and mimetic quality of our desire. We had an interview about a year ago. You did a Bishop Barron Presents interview with our friend Luke Burgess um, about yeah. his his recent book, which was on Gerard's theory yeah. of mimetic desire. It's called Wanting the Power of Mimetic Desire yeah, in Everyday Life. Yeah. So I'll include a link both to that interview and the book if you want to learn more about this aspect of Gerard's thought. Um, but let's start with scapegoating, and that's what I want to really spend the rest of the this episode discussing. Um, the theory of mimetic desire in some ways leads to the scapegoating mechanism. So introduce this to us. How does the scapegoating mechanism work? Well, here's the simple dynamic. Um, so imagine that triangular setup where now a conflict has uh, occurred because of this imitative quality of desire. Now begin to multiply that throughout a community. So let's say now you have a bunch of toddlers in the room, but move from the toddler realm to you know uh, any human community. And as, as person A wants the object because person B wants it, and then person C sees this conflict, and then there's a contagious quality to it. Now, now person C also wants that object. And before you know it now, there's a whole set of mimetically-based conflicts within the community. If this thing reaches a um, point of intensity, it's called a mimetic frenzy. And you'll see this now in a community, both large and small. You can see it geopolitically in certain societies. You can see it in the, in the smallest, uh, you know, human grouping. If it gets intense enough, Girard speculates, by a basic instinct, the group begins to look for a scapegoat whom they can blame for the problem and upon whom they can cast all of the tension and anxiety of the community. So here we are fighting like crazy. How did this happen? Well, see, the, the mimetic quality of it is often hidden, even to those who are involved, right? It, it's an often unconscious process. How did this happen? How did this happen? She's the one. It's when she came into our community, that's when we started fighting. Or those people, those people over there, who kind of look funny and talk funny and they're not like us, that when they came into our community, that's when all this trouble came about. So what do we do? We come together in casting our anxiety onto the scapegoat and thereby we find a kind of ersatz peace. At least for the moment, we've all come together in casting our anxiety onto the scapegoat. And so for the moment, 
a kind of peace breaks out among us. But as everybody knows, that kind of scapegoating move never produces real or lasting peace. And before you know it, the mimetic dynamics come back into play. So Gerard, this is now in Dostoevsky, Shakespeare, and all kinds of different people, notice this dynamic all the time. Um, can I, say, can I t- uh, share a little parable, maybe? This occurred to me as a story that might illustrate some of this. I'll do it from my world of, of religion. Imagine there's a good holy woman who, looking up to God, conceives the desire to work for love and for justice and, and for peace and to care for the poor. She's looking up at the transcendent good of God. Now, she starts doing her work. And then four or five other uh, young women, looking at her, looking at God, say, I, I, I want to do that too. That, yeah, that's, that's a beautiful life. And so they join her. And now look, all of them coming together, looking together at the transcendent and inexhaustible good of God's will. You know, we're working for love and justice and, and, and peace and care for the poor. Now, know something, Brandon, about this. It's very interesting to me. This is, I mean, Girard saw this. That good I just described is transcendent and properly inexhaustible, right? There's enough to go around for the whole world. You can never exhaust the, the work of love and justice and, and care for the poor. We can all do that, right? There's no need to have a conflict. That's an inexhaustible good. Okay, so here's a little community. Everyone's happy. It's all going great. One day, let's call her Sister Maria. She says, hey, you know, Mother Superior, Mother General, is, uh, is getting older. She's about 70, and um, they'll have to be a successor to Mother General. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty smart, and I'm, I'm pretty accomplished, and, you know, maybe that could be me. Now, watch what's happened. Originally, she looked at Mother Superior and looked where she was looking, up to the transcendent inexhaustible good. Everything's fine. But now her gaze has lowered from that good to a very worldly, finite good, being Mother Superior of this community, right? So now what does she do? She begins to plot and plan and organize her life in such a way as to put herself in position to become Mother Superior Not totally. I mean, she's still a good nun and still doing her work, but now mixed in with the transcendent desire is this very finite desire. Okay, there's Sister Maria. Now, Sister Brenda, who has joined the community with the best intentions and she's been giving her life to love and peace and care for the poor, begins to notice Sister Maria. Boy, she's acting funny. How come... How come Sister Maria is ingratiating herself to the donors of this community? And how come she's she's kind of, in a cloying way, kind of being nicey-nicey to all of us, which she never was before? And she seems to be like, Opera, y- you know what? I think she wants to be Mother Superior. Ah, now they both look down like this, and immediately what's going to kick in? Mimetic desire. I'm desiring to be Mother Superior because she wants it. I never thought about it before. It never occurred to me to be Mother Superior, but now I want it too. But look, only one of us can be Mother Superior. The mimetic desire has now produced conflict. All right, keep going. Now a third sister, Sister Jane. She looks, she starts noticing these two are bickering and they're fighting and what in the world's going on? Ah, Ah, you know, I think what's going on, they both want to be Mother Superior. But wait a minute, I, I'm pretty smart. I'm pretty accomplished. Why can't I be Mother Superior? I never thought about it ever, ever, until I saw the two of them desiring to be Mother Superior. Now, three of them have looked down to the finite good, and now three of them are fighting. Now a fourth sister, now a fifth sister, now a sixth sister. And before you know it, what's happened? A mimetic frenzy has broken out, and this community is now at odds. 
Now, look, I, I've been in the religion business for a long time, and I, you see this happening. You see this happening. What happened in that community? They, they were so good. They, they were so happy. Look, and now they're like all oh, in each other's throats. All right, let's take the last step. My goodness, what happened to us? What happened? Look, look at us. We're fighting all the time. It's when that sister, you remember? When Sister Yvonne, when she joined the group, and Yvonne, you know, she's a little, she's a little funny. You know, she's from a different background than we are, and she's, she talks a little bit funny. And she's, it's Yvonne. Yvonne is the one who caused all this trouble. And now the whole group turns on Yvonne. And maybe even accuses her of something. Read Melville's Billy Budd now. You'll see all these details perfectly laid out. They accuse her of something. And they cast her out. And for the moment, they find a kind of ersatz piece. Uh, to me, that little parable, that's the Girardian dynamic uh, displayed. The, the key thing, I know I've been rambling too much here, but the key thing is the lowering of the gaze. When together we look up, there's a nice big light here in the studio. So I'm looking up at the inexhaustible good, love, truth, justice, God's will, whatever you want to call it. And together we're looking at it and it's inexhaustible. We can all do it all the time without any conflict. You know, I lower my gaze now to a finite good and it's fill in the blank, wealth, pleasure, honor, power. You know, I use the example of becoming mother superior of the community but choose something else, money or it's influence or it's whatever. I've lowered my gaze to that. Now, almost inescapably, mimetic desire will kick in and then conflict will follow and scapegoating will result. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to say this is the be all and the end all explanation of everything, but it's darn good. It's darn good as an explanation of what goes wrong with a lot of our communities. As you say, it's maybe not the master explanation of all things, yeah. but once you begin to understand Gerard's theories, you see it everywhere. And I right. would argue, and I want to discuss for the rest of this episode, it's especially prevalent on the internet and recognizing yep. it on the internet and understanding the dynamics of it is is the first step to avoiding it and breaking this, this chain of bad behavior. So toward that end, let me ask you this question. Gerard, argues that scapegoats are not arbitrarily chosen. It's not just the community just randomly focuses their right. their uh, uh, attention on one scapegoat, but that there are specific characteristics that make someone an ideal scapegoat. For Gerard, what are some of these traits? Well, in my little parable there, I was hinting at some of them. So a person who's different, uh, looks different, has a funny accent, you know, a really good example of that is in the Gospels, right? When uh, there's the the people in the high priest courtyard as Jesus is brought in for interrogation, and there's Peter, and the crowd becomes a mob turning on him. And, and what's one of the things they say? Well, he's a Galilean. His accent gives him away. He's an outsider. He's a weirdo. He's he's not part of our gang. So it's the, the, the other quality, you know, in look, Skin color, obviously, is a massive thing in our society. Uh, accent, et cetera. So that can be one. But now flip it around, too, and here's where Billy Budd comes into play. Uh, it can be someone's beauty that that gets everyone's attention. And, and uh, wow, look at that guy or look at that lady. Look at how, how beautiful. And that can stir up a mimetic resentment and make that person a liable candidate. Look how often, I noticed this when I was doing my, my um, Second Samuel commentary, um, how in the Bible, being beautiful or handsome, it's trouble. It almost always means trouble. Think of Absalom. Think of David himself. When people are described as, as beautiful, Bathsheba, um, it usually is a, is a sign that trouble's coming. And I think it's the biblical authors being very sensitive to this dynamic of how beautiful people can attract a scapegoating attention from, uh, from a mob. What a lot of religious people find fascinating about Gerard's work is how these social theories of mimetic desire and scapegoating then collide with the world of the Bible. And it's notable that uh, uh, Gerard started with the theories and then saw them in the Gospels. In fact, yeah. 
he got them from the literary masters of the West. You've mentioned Dostoevsky, Shakespeare, mm-hmm. Melville, Proust, I think was another big one right. for him. Um, yeah. But then he came to the Christian scriptures to study them for the first time in a serious way and said he was astonished and it changed his life. W- what did he see in the gospels and how did it relate to his theories? Here's what he saw, Brandon. It's a dimension that we haven't talked about yet, but it's a curious thing. Because the scapegoat provides at least an ersat sense of peace. So we've sacrificed this victim. We've gotten rid of this person. And as a result, peace has broken out. Huh. Maybe there's something even sacred about that victim. There, there's something holy about that, that God or the gods are smiling upon our scapegoating move. Um, read Shirley Jackson's The Lottery, if you want to see that. You know, is, is there something deep, deep in the, in the deep magic, as C.S. Lewis would say, of a society that says the gods are approving of this sacrifice? They need a sacrifice. And, and in Gerardian terms, it's because we have found a kind of relief in the process. Okay, if that dynamic is true, what happens in the gospel? The Gospels know all about these dynamics. It's not that they're, they're naive or they're blind to them. Because very often, Gerard says, the great myths are kind of blind to this. They, they're they unaware of these dynamics. The Bible shows it all the time. Think of the, the uh, woman caught in adultery. It is a beautiful example of the Gerardian dynamic, right? Uh, Peter being blamed in the in the courtyard of the high priest, etc. The Gerasene demoniac. I mean, they're all over the place, Gerardian uh, stories. But here's the difference. In the Gospels, God is not approving of scapegoating violence. Rather, God is himself the victim of scapegoating violence. How do you read Jesus? Jesus is, as Caiaphas, wouldn't it be better for one person to die rather than the whole nation be destroyed? That, that's, that's Gerardian logic in a nutshell. That's perfect. Look, everybody, look how divided we are. Wouldn't it be better for one, as tragic as that might be, for one to die rather than we all be destroyed? That's the old logic. What does the gospel do is it fractures that logic. Because God is not approving of scapegoating violence. God is identifying with the victim of scapegoating violence. And thereby, this is Gerard, pulls back the veil on this whole demonic process and discloses the truth of it and shows the the way out. So that's what he saw as apocalyptic about the Gospels in the literal sense, right, of unveiling. Something was unveiled that had been hidden since the foundation of the world. This this scapegoating um, uh, farrago was hidden. And he thinks in the great myths of the world, what you find is, is the hiding, the purposeful hiding of this dynamic. The gospel ripped back the veil on it, revealed the dynamics, and showed the way out. It seems that in our digital age, the internet has only amplified this process of scapegoating yeah. many online platforms. And I'm especially thinking of Twitter, which seems tailor made for scapegoating, has allowed this to increase in our age. You know, terms like Twitter mobs or cancel culture have right. become everyday lingo. Right. And we see it not just from one or the other political party or ecclesial party, but everywhere by everyone. Uh, what do you make of the internet's role in contemporary scapegoating? Yeah, it's exacerbated it terribly. And I, it's funny, Brandon, I think of Gerard who dies in 2015. So the internet world was underway. I, I mean, he would have known probably very little about it. But the fact that he dies out in uh, Stanford, so in the uh, right in like Silicon Valley, you know, as he lived in that, there's something that Girard was like a like a prophet who was sent right right before this world sort of opened up. I think to tell us these are the dynamics at work, everybody, and and this internet world has just it's like gasoline on the fire. It's taken the the, the fire of this dynamic and thrown gasoline on it. You're exactly right, and and the language that we use is very Girardian. Mobs can break out like that online. It might have taken time before the internet for a mob even to form. Now, they can form in in seconds and minutes, right? 
Um, and then scapegoats? Are you kidding? All over the place. Someone who makes a comment or, or says something that's maybe slightly off of the politically correct can be can be just be abused massively by the mob. All that is very Girardian. Well, let's wrap up with this, Bishop. For Catholics, what's the big takeaway from Girard's theory of scapegoating and how should Catholics respond when we see it, when we detect it? How do we stop it or at least slow it down? Yeah, I think it's a very important thing in the moral life. Uh, once we see the dynamic, um, interrupt it. Interrupt it. See, mobs are formed because people are drawn into it. Uh, we're drawn into mimesis. And um, it's like, a, it's like the, a cloud forming, like a storm cloud forming. So one thing you do is actively step away from it. When you feel you're being drawn into a scapegoating mob, now, it, whether in person or online, and then call it out. Call out those dynamics. Um, reread the story of the woman caught in adultery. It is perfect illustration of all this, right? So the mob forms because people were looking for a, a scapegoat. They're looking for someone to blame. And then what Jesus does is he interrupts the process of mob formation. He turns their accusing glance toward themselves, and that causes the mob to dissipate. And then he offers a word of forgiving love to the scapegoated victim. Um, imitate him. See, there is the positive mimesis, imitatio Christi, imitation of Christ. Imitate the one whose whole life was about breaking up these false kingdoms, right? Jesus says, I've come to announce the kingdom of God. Well, think of that now as God's way of organizing our lives together. What's God's kingdom? Together, we look with Jesus to the will of his Father. You know, when the Lord says, I, I only do what I see the Father doing. I, 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 my food is to do the will of my Father. Okay, let's now look with him up to the will of the Father. We'll be great. We'll be fine if we do that. When you start seeing those gazes lowered to worldly goods, Oh, 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 red flag, because a mimetic crisis is going to break out almost automatically. So I think that's what Christians and Catholics can do. Keep your own gaze fixed at the transcendent, inexhaustible good, but then get in the way of these mimetic um, rivalries that give rise to mimetic frenzy, which then gives rise to scapegoating violence. Get in the way of it. See, once you understand it, then you can, um, you're like a good surgeon who understands the dynamics of anatomy and biology. Once you understand how this body politic is working, then you can do surgery when you have to, and you can bring health to the body. Gerard wrote nearly 30 books, and I, I know it's sometimes difficult for people to figure out where to start with him if they haven't read anything. So as we Wrap up, let me recommend just three good books. The first one is an anthology of his essential writings collected by Cynthia Haven. Cynthia was yes. not only his biographer, but a personal friend. Um, it's called All Desire is, is a Desire for Being. It was published in the UK, but you can get it online. I, think I just Bishop, read, that, read one. that one. It's very good. Yeah, very good. If you want to focus especially on Gerard's the, the religious implications of Gerard's theories. Pick up I See Satan Fall Like Lightning. It's one of his most important books and also one that's usually recommended for beginners. And then finally, the book I recommended earlier by our friend Luke Burgess called Wanting the Power of Mimetic Desire in Everyday good, Life. Yeah. So I'll include links to all three of those books here in our show notes. Well, it's time now for a question from one of our listeners. If you'd like to ask Bishop Barron something, you can send in your question at the website, askbishopbarron.com. Greg from Nebraska has done just that, and he has a, a question for Bishop about a new educational trend, and he'd like Bishop's thoughts on it. Here's Greg's question. Good morning, Bishop Barron. This is uh, Greg Verpka calling from Nebraska. I'm in the Archdiocese of Omaha. And I've noticed a increase in the number of classic education schools, particularly the elementary schools. And I'd like your, your thoughts 
of these schools, maybe in comparison to the traditional Catholic education. God bless. Yeah, thanks for that question. Brandon could answer it better than I could. He's a founder of a, of a classical Catholic high school in the Chesterton Academy, you know, family. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big supporter of them. Um, when I was out in California in uh, Ventura, the, the Augustine Academy out there by my friend uh, Mike Van Hecke, uh, it's a marvelous school, and I used to visit there, and these fourth graders are reciting Shakespeare to me, and sixth graders are reading Dante. and So, you know, really impressive the way they don't dumb the tradition down, and they assume the kids are capable of great things. When I first went there, I, with complete sincerity, I said to Mike, well, you're screening like the best and brightest here, right? I mean, you're, you're only accepting the absolute top. And he said, no, not at all. We accept anyone that wants to come. Um, but see, for so long, we've we've dumbed it down and lowered expectations for kids. So I, I'm massively supportive of that, especially at a time, as you well know, when Western culture is under assault and, uh, you know, the classics of our tradition are, are being called into question. Now, you know, having said all that, of course, someone who's thoroughly educated wants to be in dialogue, not with just with the classical tradition, but with, you know, contemporary trends of thought and what's going on in philosophy and politics and culture. So I, I don't want to defend any sort of, you know, ghettoizing of the process. But I think it's so important for our kids to be grounded in the great tradition, which then enables them to enter creatively and intelligently into the wider dialogue. So I suppose everything's got a dark side to it. There's always a always a said contra, as Cardinal George used to say. The said contra is, you know, well, if I just get in this very narrow space of, you know, Plato and Dante and Aristotle and Aquinas and but I, I don't know how to engage the contemporary culture. Well, that's a problem. But I, I don't see that really as a as a, a real issue with these schools. I think they're providing just a, a very powerful foundation. Well, as we wind to a close here, I'd like to introduce the newest book from Word on Fire. It's an extraordinary volume called Tolkien's Faith, a Spiritual Biography. It's by Holly Ordway, one of the fellows of our Word on Fire Institute. If you've enjoyed reading The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings and you'd like to know more about the ardently Catholic author behind them, this is the book for you. It's the first ever biography of J.R.R. Tolkien dedicated to exploring his deeply held Catholic faith. Holly shows in her expertly researched and richly illustrated study, uh, which contains sources and photos that have never before been published, that Tolkien's faith and his fiction are intimately related, although in subtle and complex ways. So check it out. It can be found at wordonfire.org slash Tolkien. Again, it's called Tolkien's Faith, A Spiritual Biography. Well, thanks so much for watching and listening. We'll see you next time on the Word on Fire show. Mm-hmm.